the preceding videos related a basic history of the two opposing doctrines known as the Pentecostal Second Work and the finished work of Calvary, the latter view being that accepted by most Pentecostal denominations today. We reviewed some of the history of Azusa Street and how the chief proponent of the latter doctrine, William Durham, fought a successful campaign against the erroneous view set forth by the Wesleyan Pentecostals who were mistaking the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a culminating event rather than as their baptism into the body of Christ, a sort of higher attainment in sanctification. Durham's preaching came with powerful manifestations of the Spirit's presence. However, as related in the previous video, what he was preaching was simply the proper evangelistic message rather than a comprehensive theology of Pentecost modeling the plan of redemption. However, as Durham was preaching this message as the alternative to what was put forward by John Wesley and John Fletcher as a comprehensive model of redemption, well, this is what Pentecostals accepted the finished work doctrine as being, thus stopping short of a further theological consideration of a model incorporating the Pentecostal experience known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As related earlier, Part of Durham's argument against the second work doctrine was the terribly poor fruit it produced in its advocates. The doctrine seemed to lead them into presumption concerning their spiritual attainment. It had the strong tendency to lead entire assemblies and denominations into legalism and into rigid standards of behavior which seemed to stand in the place of true holiness in word and in conduct. In other words, Durham held the doctrine up to the light of the fruit it produced, and so it seems only fair that the finished work doctrine be held up to that same standard, the standard of its fruit, and whether it has produced true holiness. So let us consider some of the Pentecostal history following Durham by considering the life, the ministry, and the legacy of perhaps his most well-known disciple, Amy Simple McPherson, the founder of the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. This venture would seem particularly appropriate given the fact that not only did Miss McPherson pick up the doctrine and forcefully communicate it to the world and to the church, well, she was also a direct disciple of William Durham, who carried a powerful spiritual mantle away from his ministry. And not only this, but McPherson advanced the doctrine of the finished work further down the slope of its logical extreme in her hallmark doctrine the doctrine for which her denomination is even named, the Foursquare Gospel. At about the same time that William Durham began his Pentecostal message, Amy Kennedy was a 17-year-old student living on a farm in Ontario. Her mother, Minnie Kennedy, had been raised under the guardianship of the Salvation Army. After the birth of Amy, her mother continued as an active devotee of this hyper-evangelistic organization. She raised her daughter within this same passionate evangelistic ethic. When Amy was 17, a Pentecostal evangelist came to her town by the name of Robert Simple. Amy began attending his meetings, and she received the message of the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Spirit through his preaching. She married Robert Simple shortly thereafter, and the new newlyweds traveled to Chicago to join William Durham's ministry, becoming disciples of William Durham. The following year, while tra traveling with Durham on his evangelistic campaigns, well, Amy suffered a violent fall down a flight of stairs, and she broke her ankle so severely that the doctor tending the injury indicated it would never be fully functional again. While convalescing, God spoke to her, telling her that if she went back to the mission where Durham was preaching and had him pray for her ankle, it would be healed. She returned to the mission on crutches and took a seat where Durham was preaching. As Durham walked up to where she was sitting, he uttered a few sentences in tongues and laid his hands on her foot, saying, In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. She describes a, a feeling like that of an electrical shock in her foot that began to flow through her entire body, causing her to shake and tremble. Feeling the pain give way to a strange coolness, she asked that the cast be cut away. Her ankle had been healed, which she demonstrated by leaping, dancing, and giving testimony. We should bear in mind 
that the time and place of this healing represented ground zero of the Pentecostal re-advent, given Durham's key role in Pentecost. Several months later, her husband announced that they would be traveling as missionaries to China. Robert and Amy Simple arrived in Hong Kong in June of 1910 and began traveling throughout China. Their mission soon had catastrophic results. Miserable over their living conditions, Amy became frantic with her husband, and after a few months of pregnancy, both of them became deathly sick with malaria. Robert was in worse shape because he also had dysentery. He died on August 17th in Hong Kong, while Amy remained in the hospital several more weeks to deliver a four and a half pound baby girl. She was thereafter returned by steamer to San Francisco and thence to her mother in New York City after a thoroughly disastrous experience as a Pentecostal missionary. She passed through several more difficult years during which she married a man by the name of Harold McPherson. After having a second child, she began to suffer acutely from depression, resulting in McPherson taking his wife to a sanitarium on March 13th of 1913. During this time, Amy maintained that she had a call to preach the gospel that was not being fulfilled. She then took her children and left her new husband, commencing upon a life of itinerant evangelistic preaching. It may be noteworthy that several months prior to her mental breakdown, William Durham, the man whose ministry was the focus of doctrine for the Pentecostal movement, unexpectedly died at just 39 years of age and under remarkable circumstances, as we related in a previous video. In the years that followed, Amy Semple McPherson would minister what seems to have been the most dramatic gift of healing since apostolic days. Her ministry was intensely evangelistic and was accompanied by an awesome sense of the presence of God. With the power that attended her meetings, the Pentecostal baptism was freely and copiously poured forth from city to city. Dramatic displays of the blind recovering sight, the deaf their hearing, the crippled walking, and the diseased recovering brought her meteoric success as an evangelist as well as it brought her into national prominence. Her ministry may have been the most spectacular demonstration the world has seen in modern times. Hundreds were sometimes healed in a single meeting, while at other meetings there might be one deaf child who suddenly received her hearing, or another child who had come running down the platform after having been carried up by a weeping father. A testament and metaphor for what God would do through the means of the baptism of the Holy Ghost to bring forth his kingdom. The miracles were clear, well documented, widely attested to, and often very dramatic. Her labors were exhaustive and her gifts extraordinary. McPherson was universally regarded as an extraordinarily charismatic individual, gifted with an unusual command of audiences and a power in her words. Oddly, film footage of her speaking sometimes presents a rather melodramatic delivery bordering on the pretentious. Give me a burden for souls, Lord. Give me a love for the lost. Let my heart bleed as I own, Lord. Give me a burden for souls. She would always appear in costume of some form sometimes in a nurse's uniform, sometimes in flowing liturgical robes. In the later days of her ministry in the Angelus Temple, her movements were observed with pomp and ceremony, her coming and going with parades and fanfare. Her manner and methods were entirely unfamiliar with anything the Pentecostal movement had seen. The McPherson ministry was powerfully anointed for success, evident in the area of outreach and evangelism. Yet, this may have been a power substantially limited by misdirection. McPherson did not preach holiness, at least not in the tradition of the holiness teachers of the bygone century, and certainly not in the Wesleyan tradition. Newly arrived Angelinos especially embraced her joyous message. Renewed health and prosperity in this life, as well as salvation in the next. Her soothing words set her apart from other evangelists of the time, who emphasized guilt, fear and denial.
the Angelus Temple communicated a sense of much activity, which may, at least from the standpoint of holiness teachers, have been misdirected into worldly endeavor, rather than in the day-to-day -day striving against sin and striving after holiness, as is arguably the thrust of apostolic writings and the teachings of Christ. Therefore, McPherson's ministry and the heated activities of the Angelus Temple became embroiled in worldly affairs. She helped the city of Los Angeles in that respect because many good men got into office because of the radio. And they knew that if they appeared on her program, that they would get a lot of votes, too. She was very influential. After the phenomenal events of her early ministry, wherein hundreds of thousands were witness to dramatic healings, miracles, and the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy concerning the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, the life and the ministry of the evangelist began a chaotic spiral into financial irregularity, scandal, infighting, moral disorder, and worldly demonstration. In fact, it's hard to gain a full sense of the turmoil and the disorder of her life and ministry without reading a full biographical account of it. In a strange and tragic irony, McPherson's ministry and personal life were pulled into such scandals as bitter controversy over property ownership between the Angelus Temple and its branch congregations in other towns, the charging of money for baptisms, infighting and litigation with church officers and fellow preachers, incidences of accepting money and gifts from persons who had been healed, bitter infighting and litigation between herself, her mother and her daughter, her remarriage after divorce, criminal prosecution for allegedly reporting a false kidnapping story in order to conceal an alleged extramarital affair, incensed denunciations from the pulpit of public officials for having prosecuted her for the kidnapping story, preoccupation with fashion, travel, and luxury following the kidnapping scandal, self-promotion, and nepotism in church affairs. But I'm sure that many people out there have their own particular troubles, only mine are always some unfortunately seem to get into the headlines. What began as a dramatic witness of the power of God to intervene in men's lives pursuant to the gospel of Jesus Christ proceeded into scandal and vice that is seldom found in the secular arena. These brought a substantial cloud upon her ministry and tore at the faith of many that had believed. The public approbation and admiration that she once enjoyed for her powerful message, accompanied by miracles of healing, turned into contempt and ridicule. The 1960 Oscar-winning movie Dilmer Gantry clearly attempts to recreate her persona in the character played by Shirley Jones, who appears as a hypocritical evangelist dressed as a milkmaid dispensing the milk of the word, overdubbed with a distinctly McPherson-esque voice. A clear mockery by the world of the evangelistic message, and a practice which seemed to become more socially accepted and prevalent in American culture after the further abuses that occurred in the 1940s and 1950s under the healing evangelists of those revival years. In spite of the tragic direction it took, the fact that her ministry was used in a profound and nearly unprecedented way cannot be reasonably refuted. The McPherson ministry and proclamation of Pentecost, although not always consistently resonating, truly constituted a sign to the world. Of the most glorious of her campaigns in terms of the Divine Presence were those in San Jose and in Denver in 1921 and 1922. Crowds came from all over the country to witness such things as the blind recovering sight, deaf children being made to hear, the crippled rising to their feet, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon whomever would take the time to ask as a result of what they saw. When asked by a reporter about her gift, she responded, There is no miracle woman here at all, only a simple little body whom the Lord has called from a milk pail on a farm, bidding her to tell the good news of a Savior who lives and loves and answers prayer. Well, this sounds as a quaint and humble thing to say, but it may be misleading. McPherson was not just called off the farm for a simple message of salvation. 
Rather, she was a direct understudy to William Durham, the man that had been given the message of Pentecost for the world, a message that he effectively proclaimed for only a few short years until his early death, a message that her husband, Robert Simple, proclaimed for only a few years until his untimely death, a message that seems to have been obscured by the failings in her own life and ministry. Nonetheless, the Spirit was poured out almost in spite of the failings of her ministry, and there is probably no ministry that so openly and powerfully declared Pentecost to the secular world than Amy Simple McPherson's, whose life stood as a depiction of the Church, commanded by the Spirit to wail like a virgin, girded with sackcloth, for the bridegroom of her youth. The Church of Jesus Christ holds precious promises, knowable only through faith in the lost bridegroom of her youth. But there is something about the Lord's baptism that we tend to forget, and which was expressed in prophetic form by McPherson in one of her early meetings. After a message in tongues, she took a vase and strewed its flowers on the platform. She then watered the flowers while singing that God would revive the saints of heaven with the latter rain. She then pantomimed the nailing of a person upon a cross, and she spoke in tongues again, and, as related in Daniel Epstein's biography of her, she interpreted the scene that just transpired. Behold, the Lord is calling. He is searching for a people for himself. Who will be willing to go all the way? Such a one will reign with me. Wilt thou? Wilt thou follow me? Behold, the way is long, the night is dark, the road is thorny. Yet trust thou me, I will be with thee. Behold thy hands, the hands that are busy with the cares of the world. They must be nailed to the cross. Art thou willing to have thy hands nailed to the cross? Thy busy feet that have walked for this world must be pierced for me. The Lord's baptism, which flowed so freely in her meetings, is a baptism into his death. Pentecost necessarily leads to this place. We may therefore conclude that the spirit of prophecy was at least present in her ministry at some point. McPherson's preaching was in an affectionate and antidotal style that was seldom threatening or demanding. In fact, she would sometimes criticize other preachers, such as Billy Sunday, whose method was to denounce sin in uncompromising and hellfire terms. Hers was a stark distinction to the tradition of the anointed Pentecostal preacher who spared no adjective in the condemnation of sin and insistence upon outward holiness. She distanced herself from the Pentecostal label. Her doctrine seems to have been substantially orthodox concerning the fundamental articles of the Christian faith. She preached the person and work of Jesus Christ with clarity and strength. If there was anything that could be described as overtly non-orthodox about her theology, we well, would have to regard the application of this orthodoxy in terms of its meaning to the Church. Her message is best remembered for its declaration of the return of the gifts of the Spirit and of the miraculous. Her best-known scripture quote is the one that is inscribed upon the proscenium arch in the Angelus Temple, which reads, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. This was a particularly relevant verse for her, given that her ministry occupied a place in time when Pentecost was being restored, and Christendom, for the most part, stood in rejection of the Lord's baptism. Pentecost was attacked from every quarter. Nonetheless, the strength of her message was, Believe in the power of Jesus Christ. And those who did so received the Lord's baptism by the thousands. If there is a peculiar doctrine that arose from her ministry, it would have to be the doctrine of the Foursquare Gospel, for which her denomination is named. The Foursquare Gospel perceives the work of God in the ministry of Jesus as having fourfold emphasis, proclaiming Jesus Christ the Savior, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, healer, and soon coming king. And this became the emphasis of her ministry as the result of an inspiration she claimed to have received while under the Spirit's anointing in her Oakland campaign of 1922. Foursquare theologian Nathaniel Van Cleve describes that event. He writes, She was preaching from Ezekiel 1, 4-10 on the four faces of the living creature in Ezekiel's vision, 
those of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. She describes the inspiration as follows. I thought upon the vision of the prophet Ezekiel. I stood still for a moment and listened, gripping the pulpit, almost shaking with wonder and joy. Then there burst from the white heat of my heart the words, Why? Why, it's the Foursquare Gospel. The Foursquare Gospel. Instantly, the Spirit bore witness. Waves, billows, oceans of praises rocked the audience, which was borne aloft on the rushing wind of the Holy Ghost revival. According to Van Cleve, this concept is also credited with the dramatic growth of the Foursquare denomination. He writes, There is no question that the Foursquare Gospel message itself was a significant factor in the Church's growth. The nation was ready for a return to apostolic power and practice, as set forth in the Book of Acts. The Foursquare Gospel focused on the fourfold emphasis of Jesus' redeeming ministry, proclaiming Jesus Christ the Savior, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, healer, and the soon coming King. It was a message that met the needs of every person wherever they lived. Furthermore, she believed it to have been given her under the Spirit's anointing to describe the full Gospel. Second, in her understanding, the title Baptizer in the Holy Spirit implied the giver of power for service rather than for sanctification. The concept of a fourfold gospel, however, as Van Cleve acknowledges, was not original with McPherson, but was taken from the philosophy of A.B. Simpson. And this was the CMA's originally stated belief system during the time Simpson and his organization were of the few to affirm the modern-day legitimacy of the charismatic gifts and to accommodate the possibility of their restoration. Simpson framed this thematic statement under a belief that the restoration of truth from the time of the Protestant Reformation would culminate in a latter reign of the Spirit's outpouring. Thus, in Simpson's mind, his fourfold gospel contemplated the Spirit's outpouring in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior, Baptizer in the Holy Ghost, Healer, and Coming King. However, amidst, amidst the upheaval within his organization caused by his rejection of the Pentecostal doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, he ultimately revised this statement. Robert M. Anderson writes, Despite the deteriorating situation, decisive action was not taken until the 1912 council meeting. A new constitution was then adopted that included a doctrinal statement which pointedly revised the earlier formula of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, Baptizer in the Holy Ghost, Healer, and Coming King by substituting Sanctifier for Baptizer in the Holy Ghost. McPherson's inspiration, restoring the Baptizer in the Holy Spirit in place of Sanctifier, was simply a reversal of Simpson's 1912 reaction against the Pentecostal teaching. But given she proclaimed the matter to be of divine inspiration, well, this leads to the question of what new truth did McPherson receive and propound by replacing Sanctifier with Baptizer in the Holy Spirit? And this is apparently the circumstance that Foursquare theologian Van Cleve tries to reconcile for us when he writes further, according to Foursquare doctrine, Sanctification is imparted with regeneration initially, and in three ways progressively. The process of sanctification is brought about through, number one, the indwelling of the Spirit, number two, the devotional reading of the Word, and number three, the cleansing blood of Christ. The use of the name baptizer with the Holy Spirit does not imply an oversight of sanctification, but focuses upon the need of empowerment for service. It implies that sanctification is a work of both regeneration and the Spirit's continuous indwelling. Nonetheless, it is difficult to dismiss the logical implication of McPherson's divinely inspired edit as an implied disregard for Christ's work as sanctifier. The focus upon power for service does not seem to alleviate this implication. Van Cleve's rationale for McPherson's dispensing with the role of Christ as sanctifier in her fourfold gospel is that sanctification is already contemplated in initial regeneration and is progressive thereafter. In so stating, he has expressed an accurate summation of Durham's finished work doctrine, though he has still to rectify the concern. No matter how we approach the issue, Van Cleve's rationale must fail, as number one, 
if we maintain that sanctification is contemplated within initial regeneration, well then why is initial regeneration itself absent from the fourfold gospel? Or number two, if we maintain that sanctification is entirely contemplated as a progressive work, well then how does said progressive work evade the office of Christ? Or three, if we accept Van Cleve's construction consistent with Durham's finished work, that sanctification involves both, well then why does neither sanctification, nor either of its alleged component parts, that is, initial regeneration or progressive holiness, find representation within McPherson's Foursquare Gospel model? Well, recognizing the theological disorder of McPherson's inspiration should certainly warrant caution in its acceptance. We might first consider the arbitrary nature of her doctrine. She does not cite to the words of Christ, nor to any apostolic writing for this doctrine. Rather, her inspiration was rested upon Ezekiel's vision of the four-faced cherub, well, a tremendous leap of doctrine without any place to plant one's foot in the apostolic gospel. But remember, this arbitrarily derived arrangement did not originate with her, but rather with A.B. Simpson. Simpson's theoretical view of Pentecost did not contemplate the feast as a sanctifying experience. Rather, he viewed Pentecost as an empowering experience, enabling the Christian to lead an outwardly moral and upright life, and to evangelize for Christ. The reason Simpson perceived the two principles, that is, sanctification and the Spirit's baptism, as so unrelated would seem to arise from the perception of his day that sanctification was in present operation, while Pentecost, at the time Simpson formulated his four-square doctrine, was something of a mystery, something still to be waited for, a future event. It was also the position of the holiness movement, of which Simpson's organization was a part, that sanctification was the common experience of all true believers, while the concept of a Pentecostal baptism was subject to a variety of theories, most of which limited its meaning as being an anointing of power for service, and particularly evangelistic service. But what was the message so clearly given at the commencement of Pentecost in Topeka on New Year's Day of 1901? While the experience was the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the message of Topeka was the essential doctrine of Pentecost, which is initial evidence. The restoration of Pentecost was supposed to have removed ambiguity over whether one had been brought into Christ through spirit baptism, that is, whether one had in fact received the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues was the evidence of having received the Holy Spirit, and therefore Simpson was far too narrow in his perception of what Pentecost meant for the believer, which is why he so disdained the apparently pointless manifestation of tongues. He did not perceive Pentecost as a work through which God would sanctify men. And these assumptions were widely shared within the holiness movement. But if any group should have perceived Pentecost as having purpose in sanctification, it was the Pentecostals, whose teaching of initial evidence identified the baptism as constituting even the gift of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, Fort McPherson, to view the baptism in the same way the holiness movement, which had rejected tongues, had perceived it, was a declension from revealed truth. Do not forget Van Cleve's explanation. He, he writes, in her understanding, the title baptizer in the Holy Spirit implied the giver of power for service rather than for sanctification. Although this misperception was an understandable mistake of the holiness movement, well, the same cannot be said for the Pentecostal movement that should have known better through its own restored theology it having been established so clearly for them in Topeka and at Azusa Street. One of the most common Old Testament references to Christ is as the Lord of Hosts. This title signifies his role as the sanctifier of God's elect. To edit this role out of a title for Christ must be regarded as theologically suspect. While the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a work having purpose in the ultimate sanctification of the believer, well, it also has purpose in the witness of God, irrespective as to whether redemption of the man be the outcome. Christ's role as baptizer in the Holy Ghost does not contravene his role as sanctifier, and neither does it appear evident that Christ's role as baptizer in the Holy Ghost should be taken as presumptive 
of his role as sanctifier, so as to omit its mention. So what is the real purpose that God gives us the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is clearly sanctification. But sanctification is not to be presumed upon because we have received his baptism, a point that Paul clearly emphasizes when he writes, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. McPherson's inspiration undermined the very purpose for receiving the Holy Spirit as well as Paul's warning to the Thessalonians that failure to pursue sanctification constituted a rejection of the very purpose for which God gives us his spirit. While Simpson's revised formula rejected the concept of Christ as baptizer, thus bringing his CMA into agreement with the common view of the holiness movement, McPherson's formula directed men to look to Christ as their baptizer without looking unto him as their sanctifier, and this was also deficient. However, we might observe that this was just the logical extreme of viewing Durham's doctrine of the finished work as a completed model of redemption. That is the assumption that because Christ did it all, well, there is no work he has yet to perform in the realm of sanctifying his baptized body. Once the Pentecostal truth was renewed in the world, the holiness movement represented no more light, but rather a darkness insofar as it rejected that truth. Likewise, had Simpson been asserting his erroneous theory on Pentecost, subsequent to God's revelation of the truth, well then his own ministry would have, as it did become, a source of stumbling. This being the case, well, what is to be concluded when an individual whose roots are in Pentecost and who ministers under a powerful anointing of God's Spirit picks up said arbitrary doctrine and edits away that portion that constitutes the very purpose for which we are given the Holy Spirit and presents it as a divine revelation. Well, Simpson may have originated an arbitrary doctrine, but it was McPherson's adaptation and prophetic mantle that rendered it prophetically false and spiritually damaging. As observed from Van Cleve's explanation, this four-square doctrine was by no means inconsistent with Durham's more general finished work doctrine. In fact, the finished work doctrine is even resorted to for theological cover, providing McPherson's new invention a semblance of correctness. This raises an inference that Durham's finished work may not be an entirely adequate explanation of sanctification in light of Pentecost, and that his entirely having dispensed with the Wesleyan view of sanctification might have been a mistake one that diverted the greater part of the Pentecostal movement from its objective of sanctification. In looking to the lampstand model, we will find the integration of both the Wesleyan and the Durham Baptistic view of sanctification. Famous and simple. Yeah. Here we go. We're going to go to number what? Uh oh. This all sound like my mama's church music. Absent an emphasis upon the work of sanctification as an office of Christ and purpose in his body, the church. The Foursquare has been at the head of Pentecostal denominations which borrow heavily from the world. The definite tendency of those Pentecostal denominations assertively holding the finished work doctrine as a comprehensive model of redemption
has been to presume upon the declaration that Christ accomplished it all, so as to suppose the sanctification to be a fait accompli. When the scripture makes it very clear, it is not at all that. Here we are inside of Angela's Temple now. To my crowd up here in the front area, I'm so excited to be in here. You don't even understand. It's amazing to me. Check this out. It's been remodeled and redone and everything. It's really nice. I'm absolutely loving this. Screens and all that stuff. Balconies and everything going on here. Oh, it's really awesome. This is way up at the top. The dome I have here. And then it crosses. That's so cool. It's very loud about the Dream Center. We own it and took care of it. Past is Matthew Barnett. And now I'm back. Here I am on. Oh, I don't know what. It's the game. It's it. So I'm going to sit down and get into a service, alright? Later. Most of the parables of Christ were on the subject of sanctification. Most of the apostolic writings dealt with the issue of sanctification, and we find sanctification to be among the chief topics alluded to in the Old Testament prophets. Why, then, are the doctrines of sanctification almost entirely absent from Pentecostalism today? Why is there so little emphasis upon, or understanding of, holiness teaching and principles of sanctification that were so richly taught during the holiness movement of the 19th century, as well as by devout persons of the Great Awakening in Puritan years. Absent this principle upon which the church is to set itself, well, the church loses its way, without purpose in its motion left to either drift back into the world where its carnal impulses may more acceptably be fulfilled, or to grope along the wall of blind religion, with perhaps only the vague recollection of what was the original hope. Church history and experience demonstrate that where Pentecost is not declared, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not commonly given. This also appears to be the case in the 19th century in regards to holiness teaching, where the Wesleyan doctrine of an instantaneous work of grace, also known as the, the divine and supernatural light under Jonathan Edwards' preaching, was not declared. It was seldom experienced. Experience with God tends to travel on the declaring of his word on the matter. Absent the fundamental teachings on sanctification, that is, the Wesleyan doctrines within which the Pentecostal movement was birthed, but the Pentecostal movement, although blessed with strong and favorable winds, lacked its rudder. Could it be something essential was left behind in the process of evangelizing the world under the divine motive force of Pentecost? Perhaps it's time to consider those teachings of the great Puritan authors, the Wesleyan doctrines on sanctification within which God sent the modern renewal of the Pentecostal experience, and the teachings of many holiness figures who knew the work of God as an instantaneous interaction with God working deliverance from sin and setting the man upon the course of true holiness, empowered over his sin nature. No doubt, holiness will discover that Christ, indeed, performed the entire work, but not so as to diminish the man, giving his all in the quest for sanctification, and so eternal life. For the prophetic encouragement even expresses it just this way. <laughs> 